Come on, can you give a shout to Jesus tonight? Jesus, we worship you. We magnify you. We declare there's no one like you. There's no one but you. That you're high and lifted up in Harvest Time Church in Greenwich, Connecticut tonight. Lord, we know that if you would be high and lifted up, you would draw all men unto yourself. So do it, God. Do it in Fairfield County. Do it in Greenwich. Lord, do it in Westchester County. Do it in White Plains, God. Lord, would you pour out your spirit in this place. Lord, would you radically change, Lord, the atmosphere around our city, around our towns, around our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. You can be seated if you can. I know about you, I just can't help but being excited and uh, seeing all the good things that God has done over 30 years. And I, I really believe it's been 30 years of miracles. Isn't it great to be a part of a church where God shows up? Where the Holy Spirit is welcomed and honored and, and uh, it's such a privilege to be a part. I was saying to Pastor Glenn and Pastor Judy, it's kind of like a homecoming uh, for us. You know, we come in. Uh, as friends, I think sometimes you come into a place, maybe for the first time, uh, you're a visitor, but every time after that, you're just family, and, and uh, what an amazing weekend we've had so far, and I just want to honor Pastor Glenn and Pastor Denise, they've just done an amazing job in the nine or so years that I, I've known them, and I just love their hearts, and uh, I, I, love, uh, I love when God changes you in the midst and, and I remember just coming on a Sunday morning I had a rear uh, Sunday morning off and I came uh, and I remember Pastor Glenn preached one of the most amazing messages I ever heard uh, it was simply entitled I think what about your ways or what about our ways and it was one of those life-changing things and I took notes and for the first seven times I preached it I gave him credit and, the, and, and then <laughs> And then I started saying, I heard it somewhere, and then finally I realized it was revelation, so the Lord gave it to me. Uh, and, uh, but it's a life-changing message. It was one of those aha moments in God that unlocked something in me, and that really took me to the next uh, level, the next place. And I, I love the character uh, of God, the integrity uh, of the pastor that you have, but I love the spirit of the Lord. I love the way the Holy Spirit is honored here and uh, he's really welcomed and and uh, I wanted to just invite Pastor Judy up to greet with you to greet you and share what's on her heart a minute and uh, we believe in team ministry and Pastor Judy and I uh, have gone uh, around the world together and and uh, she gave me my first shot to preach outside of my local church and had me come to Sioux Falls so uh, if you like me thank her if you don't blame her uh, and uh, give God the glory anyway amen Give God the glory. Come on. And give it to him. For all the things that he has done. I just was sitting there remembering, reading a passage of, of scripture that I'm sure you're all familiar with. And that was when um, the queen of Sheba heard about Solomon. The Bible said that, first of all, she was in, in another country and she heard. Everybody say she heard. She heard of uh, this great man, his great wisdom, and this great house. And then after she heard, she went. She went. And then after she went, she saw. And the Bible said that she saw the men around Solomon. And, and, and they, were, they looked, they dressed really. Look at Pastor here. Look how he's dressed. Just stand up. Come on. Stand up. Stand up. Just turn around. Ooh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Philip, come on, Philip. You had your suit on. Take, take your burden cap. That's it. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> and she saw the men, how and, and the people around him, how how they were dressed and how they sat around the table. We sat around the table today, y'all. Yeah. Wonderful. And how they were just tuned in with who he was and and what the presentation that he made. And and she took note of how they talked and how they honored him and and how they had the same spirit. She saw, and she spoke, she heard, and then she gave. Yeah. And she said something. She said, you know what? I heard about this man, but after I came, I saw more. And she said, and the half has never been told. 
Pastor Glenn and Pastor Denise, that's what I say to you and this great church. And at 30 years, but the half has not been told yet. We bless you and we celebrate you in Jesus' name. Aren't you glad to be a part of? Aren't you glad to be connected to? It's important where you hang your hat at. The Bible talks about uh, the same anointing that's upon the priest will be upon the people, you know. And then we learn in school, sociologists and psychiatrists that, you know, birds of a feather. Association brings about. I thought the superintendent said y'all was a smart church. Association brings about a simulation. So yeah, so it, it's important who you hang around. You want to be a winner, you hang around winners. You want to be productive, you hang around productive people. Amen. You want to be spiritual, you hang around people that are spiritual. You want to be strong, you hang around strong people. You want to be weak, you hang around weak people. Depends on who you are and what you want to do and where you want to go in life. I believe we're going someplace. Amen. I love harvest time. One of the pastors um, of this church, one of the great pastors of this church is our executive pastor. Did you hear me say our? <laughs> our executive pastor. Um, is Pastor Faith in here? Pastor Faith, come on up here. Give her a hand to us. Go Faith. Go Faith. Yeah. She's, we're, we're her partners in crime tonight. And um, we're getting ready to, where's Denise? Can somebody get Denise real quick, real quick, real quick? Is she available? Not available? Let's, okay, I, yeah. Bless one of the, the children, God. Bless in Jesus' name. Um, Faith is, we're, we're going to do something, and we know that, how many, how many know your pastor? It's not like you to make a big deal over him, although he is a big deal. But he's a like for you to make a big deal over him. He's just like, do what you got to do, get out the way, and just worship Jesus. But um, I got the mic tonight, <laughs> and uh, he can't have his way tonight. So, uh, you know, we, David and I, we all got time for this. We got time for this. And so, so I'm going to give this to Faith, but we, we're standing here with Faith because, you know, when pastor decides to shoot Faith, yeah. I'm going to resurrect her. <laughs> And then when he gets mad at me and shoots me, David's going to resurrect me. <laughs> and then, I take the gun away because I don't want to be next. Yeah. <laughs> and then Denise is going to say, enough of that. Uh, it's okay, Pastor. It's okay, it's okay, Pastor. All right. God bless you. We love you. We love you. We really do. Pastor Glenn, could you come? We're going to have to do this alone, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. We couldn't let this weekend go by without taking the opportunity to honor you and to thank you for your leadership of Harvest Time over the past 15 years, half of the life of Harvest Time. And we wanted to recognize you as the gift that you are to all of us. As Dave, Pastor David and Pastor Judy uh, so powerfully prophesied this morning, and I can't even try to, to quote what they said, um, talk to Philip. He has it on, on his phone. But um, he talked about Pastor Tate and Patty uh, planting a solid foundation on harvest time in place. And then in February of 1999, you and Denise took the helm. And, and you stepped into some very big shoes. But in the words of Denise, kaboom. <laughs> Just look what the Lord has done. Pastor Glenn, you have built an amazing structure upon that foundation. It's a structure of ministry, of discipleship, of healing, of intercession, worship, and so much more. And as time goes by, the levels keep rising higher and higher. There's so many things we could say about you. You're the visionary that led us from the Civic Center into this beautiful home. And every time we hit a snag along the way, he would come up with this idea that just baffled the architects and, and even the, the lawyers, and it was amazing all the so-called professionals, but he has the wisdom of God. 
You're an amazing communicator of the word of God. You're spirit-filled and spirit-led. The sermons that are released from this pulpit contain life-changing revelation that is saving and transforming the lives of so many people. And now they're being released worldwide through the web and on YouTube and live streaming. And you will never know the side of heaven, the impact that you have had on this world. But to be shamelessly selfish, I can't, shamelessly selfish, to us here at Harvest Time, you're the father of this house. You pray for us, you intercede for this congregation collectively and personally daily. Denise meets weekly with intercessors just to pray for all of us. And Pastor Glenn, when I and when the staff hear the prayers that you pray in staff meeting, we know and we feel your heart of love for this house, for the church, for marriages, for children, and for our nation. You teach us, you motivate us, you encourage us, you admonish us, and you stretch us to accomplish things we never thought we could do. And you, you made us the people that God has called us to be. You're still working on us. <laughs> We thank you for your sacrifices you've made on behalf of us and on behalf of the kingdom of God. So the congregation of Harvest Time just wanted to take this opportunity to personally honor you and to let you know how much we love you, how much we appreciate you, how much we thank you, and thank the Lord for giving you to us. Uh, this is a simple box that Debbie's holding, but inside of it are cards and letters and memories and photos and gifts from your people, your children here at Harvest Time. And there's many more that are on the way. Uh, we wanted in some small way to bless you for the blessing and the gift that you are in our lives. We love you so much. <laughs> Would you stand and give us a blend? doesn't like this. <laughs> the Bible says honor to give honor to whom honor is due. And when an elder serves well, give him double honor. Here's, this is not a little token of love. It's a big token of love from the heart of our hearts because our heart is big, so it's a big token of love from David and I. <laughs> Just a, a nice weekend with you and your wife, and we want you to know how much we love you, appreciate you, and honor you for just bringing this wonderful house into the kingdom and allowing a place for people to know God and to serve God. You can go back to your seat now. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> to God be the glory. To God be the glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Before you take your seats, uh, Prophet David is going to come and just release something to us. And I want to encourage you on tonight, and not only tonight, but, but the season uh, that we're in here at Harvest Time. We, who was it? Henry Blackaby wrote a book years ago, and that I think has been uh, in the, everybody's Bible study, and it was Experiencing God. Remember that book? Great book, Experiencing God. And what I want to uh, give to you tonight uh, is something that the Holy Spirit spoke to me concerning the body because you're out there and you're looking at us up here and you're watching God use us and we're speaking words of wisdom and we're flowing out of the anointing that the Lord has placed upon us and you know we, we consider ourselves the fivefold ministry and walking in that and releasing it unto you but the fivefold ministry pastor teacher prophet evangelist uh, we're, the Bible says in Ephesians that we're here to equip you and to, uh, uh, to, to pour into you and to, to build you up and to bring you to a place where you can hear and you can grow into the fullness. 
but we are not here to carry you all your life. So what we do is we release unto you so you can turn around, leave out of these doors, and release to the world. That's what the fivefold ministry is. So while you're looking at us saying, powerful, great, anointed, we're looking at you and saying, powerful, great, anointed. The bomb.com. Yes, and that's who you are. And so as, as, as we release unto you, the Bible says in John 4, um, yeah, John 7, 38, 30, 38, 39, if you believe, as the scripture has said, if you believe this word, how many believers do I have? If you, be, if you believe this word, not just come to church, but if you believe what, what, what prophet is getting ready to say and, and release, as the scripture has said, out of your bellies, out of your innermost being shall flow rivers of living waters. And this is what God is looking to flow out of you. Don't look at us. We're looking at you. And say, take what you get and be released in the name of Jesus. And take your own river. Experiencing the presence of God. Experiencing the word as it comes out of our mouth and goes into your heart. Experiencing uh, the Shekinah glory. And we've, last year, or the early part of the year, the outpour. Wonderful, great. I was a part of it. Experiencing God. But then after we experiencing it, after we experience it, what? Yeah. What? 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 Not to stay here. And so this is what I want to say to you. That the year 2014, again, is going to allow us a chance. It's going to give us wonderful opportunities to let people experience what you have. Because certainly you have experienced the best right here. And as the faith comes in, it must go out. And as God has placed his anointing upon you, and you all can say, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me. And he has anointed me. Point to yourself and say, he has anointed me. You are anointed. He has anointed me to mend the brokenhearted, to set the captives free. This year, as we leave out of 2013, as we leave this 30th year anniversary, this season that's upon us, let's make a solemn commitment in the presence of God, to our God, that we're not only going to experience, but we're going to allow people to experience it from us, from you, from you, from you, from you. And as we leave this anniversary time, there's such a sanctioning from the Holy One of Israel. There's such an approval upon you and, and what, what God has done down through the years. There's such an approval on the relationships. And God is saying something to us. That as you allow people to experience what you have experienced, you're going to see the latter rain that you've been asking for. Hallelujah. You're going to see the former and the latter rain. You're going to see the prophecy of the, of the prophet Haggai that says, and you shall see the glory of the latter house, and it shall be greater. Because Christ in you is the hope of glory. I want you to get ready for the best year you've ever had in your life. Get ready for God to use you, you. Get ready to be released from condemnation, to be released from shame, to be released from fear, to be released from doubt, that you'll stand and say, therefore, there is now no condemnation to them that walk in Christ Jesus and that walk in the Spirit. Be free in Jesus' name. Come on, be free in Jesus' name. Be free to receive all that he is for you. You're going to receive an impartation tonight. You're going to receive from the hand of God. You're going to receive from the heart of God today. Open your hearts wide. Offer no resistance to what he's getting ready to do. Just be hungry tonight. Take it all in tonight. David said last night, if you want it, come and get it. Come and get it.
the table is spread and everything that God has for you is for you. You will not be denied. You will leave out of here more powerful than you've ever been in your life because you got a new understanding. Because you understand something more. Hallelujah. Come on and raise your hand right now. Raise both hands in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Come on, just keep your hands stretched towards heaven. I really believe that we're stepping into something tonight. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, I'm filling the atmosphere with expectation and miracles once again. There is more taking place in the realm of the Spirit than you can see or even fathom. For I'm gathered you as those who have married your hearts to mine. A sound is going to be released in the days that are ahead that will begin to shake the chains off of people in places that have been held captive by the enemy. The very gates of hell are about to be shaken off of their hinges as the oppressed are set free by an army of worshipers and lovers who will arise and move with one heart, one voice, and one purpose. This is not an ordinary meeting. You're not an ordinary people. And this is not an ordinary anniversary celebration. This is a setup. I am setting you up to receive the inheritance of all that I have promised you. The heavens are open and the waters are stirred. Come with expectation, ready to receive and be activated into the fullness of your calling. I'm putting things in motion and accelerating my people into their purpose and destiny. Nations and regions are about to be won and discipled in a day. And you are being commissioned to be a part of the fulfillment of that promise. I am going to use this gathering as a catalyst and this church as a catalyst to launch one of the greatest moves of my spirit that the earth has ever seen. I'm calling you to come from behind the veil and prepare to view the victorious king. You are going to have a royal and a holy visitation. You're about to see the majesty and the sovereignty of God like never before. Prepare to see him face to face. Get ready for a throne room encounter. For I want to reveal myself and all of my splendor and majesty, says the Lord. I'm establishing a new kind of normal in the earth and in this church. Through the days, through these meetings and the days ahead. Incredible manifestations of power and love are going to be poured out upon this house like never before. Miracles, signs, and wonders are going to fill the meetings uh, even in the days ahead. As you partner with heaven through this historical movement, I will breathe my life on dry bones and desolate places in this region and around the globe. I have sovereignly designed these meetings and this celebration to spark fresh fires of hope and personal revival in you once again, says the Spirit of the Lord. Come on, I believe right now the word of the Lord. I believe now the word of the Lord. Come on, right now. I believe that there's a move of God that God is releasing in our midst. And you can either get on board or you can get left behind. But I'm praying this prayer. God, do whatever you want to do in this place. God, do whatever you want to do in this region. God, do whatever you want to do. Just don't do it without me. Come on, I believe right now there is a deep desire coming upon the people. There's a fresh faith rising up in this house tonight to not only say, God, do do it again, but God, do what has never been done before in Greenwich, Connecticut, in New England, in New York, in this nation, in the nations of the earth. Come on, you're a part of an end time movement. Come on, you are the next move of God. You are the next outpouring. You are somebody's healing. You are somebody's miracle. Come on, right now, you are the next revival. Don't look any further than the mirror. Come on, don't look any further than this room tonight. I hear the Lord saying, Tag, you're it. You're it. You're it. You're what this generation is looking for. Come on, before he comes for his church, he's coming to his church. I, I want to be a part of that. Come on, you can be seated if you can. Some amazing things are happening. I, I saw something uh, amazing this morning as, as we were uh, ministering over the, the founding pastors and Pastor Glenn and, and Denise this, this morning. Uh, it was a really a moving thing to watch. 
Because I, I've watched churches transition, and most places they transition because they don't do it right. Somebody leaves, somebody gets mad, somebody gets glad, somebody gets fired. <laughs> but, but here, how, how many know, a, a mantle was passed. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this weekend's been so filled with honor. Yeah. And, and honor is so important because what you honor, you become. Amen. When you honor the presence of the Lord, He'll allow you to become the presence of the Lord. When you honor a move of God, he'll allow you to become a move of God. And I looked around the room this morning when I was done ministering, and, and I saw something. I, I saw tears coming down this amazing woman of God's cheeks. And, and I saw the hand of the Lord. I saw the hand of the Lord. And I saw the Lord building a foundation of the prayers of those that have gone before. And I believe that this is the season where those that were here even in the pioneering days of this movement are, are about to see the fruition of the promises of God. Things that were prayed in prayer rooms and in meetings beforehand. I believe we're about to step into those moments. I believe many of you are about to step in to, to family and household salvations. I believe, my friend, my... My sweet sister right here, you're going to see the ordination of your grandson. I believe there's an anointing. There's an anointing to destroy yokes and break chains on his life. And I believe this, that there are many of our children right now, they're surrounded by mama's prayers and grandma's prayers. I'm living proof. You can't outrun them. You can't outdrink them. You can't outrebel them. You can't outhide them. And we're living into this season that we must know that, that without prayer there is no harvest. Jesus said that the harvest is already ready, but the laborers are few. Pray, therefore, that the Lord of, har of the host would raise up laborers, harvest reapers. Come on, I, I believe we're an answer to that prayer. But, but I believe that there's, there's a fiery anointing coming on this house like never before. I believe that this church is about to explode because of prayer meetings, because of what's happening in a war room, what's happening at an altar. People crying out to God. I don't know about you, but there's something on the inside of me. As great as what we're celebrating in the last 30 years, as great as the things we've seen together and the things that God has been doing here and around the world, there's something on the inside of me. There is a divine dissatisfaction that says, God, this isn't the half of it yet. God, there must be more. Come on, with the Lord, there's always more. There is always more. I believe we're about to step into a living legacy in this place. When I, when I think about Harvest Time Church, this is what I think about. Harvest Time Church is a place to encounter God. It's a place of encounters. I was watching well until about 11 o'clock last night. People at the, at the altar just, just worshiping the Lord encountering God do you know that we have a God that you can encounter yeah. this is a place of miracle encounters God has anointed you to be an encounter with the Lord I believe that this house is an apostolic resource center it's one of the words that I have heard from the first time I walked in the door that this is a sending church that this is a giving church that this is a going church I believe one of the reasons that this church is so blessed is because you haven't kept it to yourself. Most churches in America spend about 98% of their budget on themselves. But this is a church of export. You're a part. You put some go in the gospel. If you take go out of the gospel, you're just left with another spell. How many know that two-thirds of God's name is go? Works in English, not Portuguese or Spanish, but, but it works in English. <laughs> right? There's an anointing coming on. You're a sending church, which often means that you pay when people come and you pay when you send them out. It's a part of being a resource, a, a training center. But more than that, you're a house where sons and daughters of God could be raised up to encounter God, to walk in it. When I, look at, when I look at Philip, well done, grasshopper. You know, when I, when I look at him, today he was just sharing stories of things he was seeing as a, as a teenager.
people being healed and raised up. Something was lit on the inside of me. Because there's a hunger and a thirst. This is a place where he can grow and, and be who God's called him to be. Come on, I, I believe that this is an Antioch church. It's a church of, of pioneers creating with God. You, you heard uh, Pastor Faye talking about Pastor Glenn. Is, he's our visionary. What's a visionary? Somebody who sees what God is doing next and then does it. See, I believe we're in this next season of God. We're not stepping into a new day. We're not stepping into a new year. I believe we're stepping into a new era as a house, as a church, as a people. And you have been anointed. You've been anointed as that apostolic resource center. But I believe that this house is about to be filled with prophetic encounters. You're about to encounter the voice of God like never before. But I believe there's a realm of revelation. This is one of the easiest places that I ever get to come and minister. There's like a portal of revelation over this house. Where God just pours. And, and don't get freaked out by terms like pro prophetic and revelation. It's just simply God revealing His heart to His sons and His daughters. And, th and there's just an open heaven to hear the voice of God. Do you know there's certain things that haven't happened in harvest time yet because you haven't said them yet? There's certain things that haven't happened in your house yet, in your business yet, in your marriage yet because you haven't spoken them yet. Amos 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless He speaks it first through His servants or His friends, the prophets. Not talking about long skinny guys with, with, with goat hair and long beards. Sometimes he's talking about handsome, humble guys like up in no, no. <laughs> It's my cross to bear. Pastor Glenn's as well. Handsome and humble. Real, really difficult. <laughs> I'm prophesying those things that are not as though they were. <laughs> and, and, right. but, but there's things that haven't... I believe he's speaking about you. You are created to hear his voice. Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he speaks it first through his servants or his friends, the prophets. In John chapter 10, Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. I love that scripture. I love the picture, but I never got it until February of this year. I was in South Africa, and I was around a real sheep herder, a real sheep rancher. And I was talking to them. I said, what is this? I, I love this scripture, but can you explain it to me from your perspective? He said, I'll show you. And we hopped in his truck, and we drove out to his pasture. And when we pulled up, there were sheep that were grazing and, and they were just minding their own business and they looked up when he pulled up but they didn't really do anything but put their heads back down and eat some more. And we had the windows up and he said, now when we get out, don't say anything. And we stood at the gate and they again lifted their heads and went back down to grazing. But then he did something phenomenal. He just did this. Sheep, come. And that whole herd of sheep came running to the gate he said my sheep know my voice they knew that as soon as I opened my mouth and called them I had something for them it was different than what they were eating it was different than what they had I had what they had a taste for can I tell you something you are created to hear his voice I like what it continues to say in verse 8 a lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? In other words, when you declare the word of the Lord, the lion of the tribe of Judah gets up from his throne. He points his face to the earth and he releases a roar of revelation. The earth begins to shake. The fear of the Lord, which is missing in the earth today, is restored. And then he asks the question, who can but prophesy? In other words, who's exempt? Some of you right now, God's anointing you to listen. We were singing that song from the, the early days of harvest time. Open my eyes, Lord. I want to see Jesus. Open my ears, Lord. There is an opening of your ears tonight to hear the voice. My friends, it is not a matter of future and fortune as much as it is a matter of life and death. Somebody's miracles on the other side of you opening your mouth. Somebody's salvation is on the other side of you opening your mouth. How many know Proverbs says that the power of death and life are in the tongue? I believe that's whether you open your mouth or not. We're responsible for what we say, but also for what we don't say. 
One of the greatest things I ever saw, I was in Venezuela and I was preaching and it, there was this uh, chaotic scene. We were uh, in a night meeting. There's about a thousand people in this open air place and we were surrounded by other buildings in this compound. Uh, on my right, there was a wedding hall and it was loud and behind me was a discotheque and it was even louder. And on the other side, there was this thatch roof bar where people were drinking and carousing. And, and I was one of those nights where I was just trying to preach and couldn't find any traction. Nothing was making sense. You couldn't hear the worship team. And it was just, I, I couldn't even hear myself preacher talk. And I, I got discouraged and, and I went to shut my Bible. And the Lord said, don't stop, keep going. And right about the time I thought I was preaching good, probably the best message I ever preached until tonight. The, the, some of you will get that tomorrow morning by the, by the third time Pastor Tate preaches. Uh, and, and all of a sudden the Lord said, stop. So I kept preaching a little while longer in case it wasn't the Lord. Uh, now, I know some of you are more spiritual than me. You would have stopped right there. But he said, speak to the woman on the other side of the wall. Her name is Anna Esther, and she just prayed what she thought was her last prayer. God, if you're real, speak to me. And so I stepped out in faith, spelled R-I-S-K. I believe there's an anointing coming on you. You're going to change the way you spell faith to R-I-S-K, that we will look really, really foolish unless, unless God does what we say He'll do. God doesn't mind us putting the pressure on Him. I believe right now that expectation and faith is rising in this room. And I just did the only thing I could do. There was a 12-foot wall or so I couldn't see on the other side. And I just said, Anna Esther, you're 26 years old. You're on the other side of the wall. You just prayed what you thought was your last prayer. God, if you're real, speak to me. If you're going to hear me, Anna Esther, don't take your life. But come through the wedding into the front of where I am. And I went back to preaching, hoping that everybody would forget in case I missed it. <laughs> now, Pastor Glenn never misses it. I'm just afraid that sometime I might. And all of a sudden, about three minutes later, this beautiful, long, black-haired girl comes walking through, mascara running. She said, my name's Anna Esther, and she takes a gun out of her purse and puts it on the platform. She said, I found my husband cheating on me in the discotheque, and I knew he was, and so I was going to sit in his car and blow my brains out and wait for him and his girlfriend to find me. But before I did, I leaned up against the wall and said, God, if you're real, speak to me. That's when you call me by name. She gave her life to the Lord. Her testimony is that now her and her husband have been fully restored. They're now pastors of a church in Caracas, Venezuela. It's the power of the prophetic. It's the power of the prophetic. There are people all over Greenwich, Connecticut all over Manhattan, all over New York City, all over New England, crying out, God, if you're real. And we have another meeting and another prophecy line. And without any disrespect, we don't deserve to hear two prophetic words until everybody's at least heard one. There are people desperate for the presence that you carry. You have been born to be a prophetic encounter. You are a prophetic encounter. Come on, I, I believe some things are going to change by, just by the way, things you declare. I'm not talking about name it and claim it. I'm, not, I'm saying shout it and grab it if you have to. I'm saying when you hear the word of the Lord, don't hesitate. I, I break the fear of missing it off of you. Some of you say, well, what if I miss it? What if you don't? I release right now bold prophetic faith all that I carry and more I release upon this people come on I believe there's a revolution getting ready to take place in the spirit that harvest time is a part of that you have been called to as a region to birth forth another awakening another great outpouring of the Holy Spirit and it will be too good to keep inside the walls of this church I believe the next outpouring is going to break out of the walls of the church and sweep through the streets and the high schools and the elementary schools and the junior highs and the middle schools and, and into the universities into Wall Street, into your marketplace assignments. It's the power of the prophetic. I have five great kids and my son Benjamin is 13. And he's walking in this, I mean he calls me out on stuff. 
And I repent quick because he's got this tight relationship with God. And he doesn't have a religious filter. (laughs) He just says it like it is with compassion, but how it is. He was sitting in his class. Now, this is a kid who the Lord spoke to in second grade that said, uh, son, I want you to tell your parents to take you out of Christian school and put you in public school. And I said, son, you have everything right there in our Christian school. It's great. All your friends are there. And he said, but dad, Jesus called me to be light. And I don't want to be light around other light. I want to be light in darkness. And we sent him to public school. Because I realized the Christian school isn't in charge of raising my kids and giving him what he needs spiritually. That's my job. And all of a sudden, something happened. And in the last five, six years of public school, he's won over 200 children to the Lord. He walks in this, in this boldness. Last month, I was in Holland. It was about 3 in the morning, and I get a phone call, and my son calls me and says, Dad, I've got to tell you something. You know, Mr. Lowe, the teacher I don't like. I said, yeah, what about him? He said, I was in his class, and Jesus told me to pray for him. So I sat there, and I prayed for him, and Jesus said, no, not like that. Go up to him and pray for him. And I said, Jesus, he doesn't let anybody approach his desk all year. He said, nobody can come to my desk. So if you want me to pray for him, he's going to have to break his own rule and say, if anybody has any questions, come up here. Two minutes later, Mr. Lowe said, does anybody have any questions? You can come up here. So he went up to the desk. Mr. Lowe looked at him and said, what can I do for you, Benjamin? He said, sir, it's not about me. It's about you. Can I talk to you in the hallway? 13 years old, 8th grader, Ransom Middle School, public school. And he takes him out into the hallway. And he said, Mr. Lowe, what happened to you two years ago that broke your heart and put a hole in your soul? And the guy started weeping. He said, I lost my spouse two years ago. And Benjamin said, what would you do if I told you I had something, rather someone that can fill that hole in your heart and in your soul and you would never be lonely or hurt again? Would you like that? And the guy started weeping and my son led him to the Lord in the hallway. And he said, now God is giving you a new name. You won't be Mr. Low, you'll be Mr. High. You won't be known as the pervert teacher any longer. But you're going to be known as a man of integrity and a man after God's own heart. And the guy begins to break down uncontrollably. Pulls out his wallet and takes out a handwritten note that his mother wrote to him 25 years ago. That says, and you will be known as a man after God's own heart. Why am I sharing that? Because I believe there's an anointing coming on children in this next season that the children of harvest time, the Holy Spirit's about to pour out on them. They're going to prophesy. They're going to dream dreams. They're going to declare. They're going to bring salvation. They're going to be light in the darkness that what we're a part of isn't just for us, but it's for our children and our children's children. Number two, this is going to be a house that you're going to encounter miracles like never before. Psalm 77 says that he is the God who performs miracles, who performs so many mighty deeds that we cannot even fathom them. Job says that he's the God who does miracles and mighty works that nobody can even count them. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 12, that now that I go to be with my Father, now even greater works shall you do. Can I tell you something? You're on the verge of the miraculous. I was looking around. I've been talking to some of you this weekend. And I've heard how my my marriage was a mess. I was a heathen. I wasn't serving God. But I got radically saved in this place. And my family is together. And my body's been healed here. And I'm thinking, wow, there's some churches in America that have never even had one of those testimonies. And this room is filled with those testimonies tonight. Come on, I want to celebrate what God has done. Come on, I believe there's a rich heritage of miracles in this place. Come on, I believe that there's an atmosphere 
As I walked in tonight, it was like I saw a cloud from the ceiling down to the floor. I believe that people are going to walk in sick, but they'll walk out healed. I believe before the first song, before a message is preached, before an altar call, people are going to walk into their healing. I saw a honeycomb over this room just dripping honey. It's the honey of healing. I believe that there are miracles. I believe that this is a birthplace of miracles where people can encounter a miracle-working God. Aren't you glad that God's not dead? Aren't you glad that God can overpower you? Can I be honest? I would never serve a God who couldn't overpower me. Because if he couldn't overpower me, he couldn't overpower my enemies. But we serve a God who overcame death and hell and the grave. And the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead is living on the inside of us. It's miracle time for harvest time. It's miracle time for harvest time. I believe that this is going to be a season where there is focused faith getting ready to fill this room. I believe God's going to send you the most impossible cases. Can I just be so bold and say that I believe harvest time is going to be a cancer-free zone. Come on, I believe it. I believe in the miracle-working power of God. I like what Paul said in Romans 1 and 16. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. I refuse to water it down. I refuse to be so seeker sensitive that I don't recognize who God's really sending us. Come on, the world is hungry for the supernatural. Just look around us. I'm sorry to inform you because they haven't gotten it in the church. They've gotten it from Saturday morning cartoons. This generation is prone. It's predispositioned to the supernatural realm. And if they don't find it in the church, they'll go elsewhere for it. Come on, we're living in a generation where we're afraid of offending people with the power of God. Come on, please. People that have pierced, tattooed, and colored every body part known to man, and a few not yet discovered, and we're going to offend them with miracles and healings? Come on, I believe right now. I was just thinking that, that we could have gone a little bit back further in time and worshiped through the years, through the decades, and well, how about that lounge lizard worship, you know? Healings, nothing more than healings. Whoa, 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 healings. I, I just had to wake some people up, that's all. Now you know what my gift is not. And, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be here if it weren't for miracles. I would have been dead in 1997 from my 10th suicide attempt. But when I dropped dead, God resuscitated me. After two and a half days in a coma, a bright light came in the room. And the Lord said, son, I've not changed my mind about you. I've called you to go around the world preaching the gospel. Wherever you go, lies have touched and changed. They had just told my mother, get ready to pull the plug. He's not going to live. And God raised me up in a moment. Three years ago of malaria, I died three times, but the Lord completely healed my body. I, I don't know about you, but I, I refuse to live outside of the, the power, the supernatural promises of God. I was in Australia. And it was a late night, and I was flying out the next day. I had to leave about four in the morning. And I was in this... I'd preached eight times on a Sunday. Started at 7 in the morning and it was now 8.30 at night. And I'd finished and I was looking forward to just going and packing and heading home. And they said, can you do one more meeting? There's a group of 120 young people upstairs waiting for you. I said, 120, upper room, big trouble. <laughs> I ministered, God moved. And about 10.30, I was getting ready to say goodnight. And the Lord said, I want you to give every person in the room a word. I said, this is going to be easy. Faith, hope, love, repent. You know. You know. And I ministered to the first person. It was like three minutes long. And finally about three o'clock in the morning came. And there was a girl standing there with arms crossed. And the Lord said, tell her I want to heal her scars. And I started praying, Lord, heal the scars in her heart. And he said, don't say that. Tell her I want to heal her scars. I said, daughter, God says that he wants to heal your scars. And she said, my arms are burning. And all of a sudden, she lifted up her sweatshirt and thousands of cuts where she had cut herself, mutilated herself, 
God completely healed every scar and grew back the skin. She immediately gave her life to Jesus. The next guy, the guy next to her, he said, I, I, before you pray for me, I want you to know I hate you. And I said, well, I love you too. <laughs> and he said, here's why I'm so mad. First off, I didn't want to be here tonight. But this girl right here that just said, ow, my arms are burning, and we, she made me come. And I tried to leave seven times, and I went out to my car, and I tried to smoke meth, and I couldn't get high. I shot up heroin, and I couldn't get high. And I said, I wonder why. <laughs> the Spirit of God hit him, and he began to weep, and all of a sudden, the Lord healed every, every track mark in his arms, and he gave his life to Jesus. Hallelujah. Afterwards, he said, I really love you. They invited me to Mackers. It's what they call McDonald's. And so I went, and, you know, 3 o'clock in the morning, just enough time to make one more bad decision before bed. <laughs> Not as bad as what we have in the South. Awful house. If you don't know what Waffle House is, it's a gas, gas station bathroom that serves waffles. It, it, it just, it, it will never get the cleanliest restaurant award. But you just keep going because it, it's really good but really bad at the same time. It's just, so, so they took me to McDonald's and we order food and we're sitting there and the girl who had her arms healed starts going... And I'm thinking, I'm at McDonald's with a weirdo. <laughs> and she just yells out, who here doesn't have a sense of smell? The manager said, I've never smelled anything. She said, if you've never smelled, you've never tasted. She said, I've never smelled and I've never tasted anything. I was born without a sense of smell. I was born without a sense of taste. And the girl was ordering her happy meal or whatever it was and when she went to exchange the money the woman who received the money in the transaction fell out under the power of God and all of a sudden she went I can smell the coffee I can smell the french fries and you say why is that important if it mattered to the manager of McDonald's it mattered to God then all of a sudden the girl sees a policeman she sees him at the door him and his partner. And she does what I wouldn't advise you to do, but she doesn't even ask permission. She said, what's wrong with your back? He said, well, I've had three back surgeries. I need another one, but if I have it, I'm going to lose my job. And she lays hands on the Aussie cop at the door, and he falls out under the power of God. His partner goes for the gun. He gets up and he says, what happened? My, my back is healed. And I said, Lord, why is this happening? He said, oh, it's simple. She doesn't know how to behave in church. <laughs> she doesn't know that this can only happen in a room on Sunday between 8 and 11. She, she doesn't know that you can't take the church from the church into McDonald's and make that the church. Yeah. She doesn't have any religious predispositions or thinking. She just had an encounter with God. And now she's sharing that encounter. It's contagious. The, the cop got appealed, gives his life to the Lord. The partner gives, her life to, gives his life to the Lord. At 4 o'clock in the morning, there are people laid out in the parking lot of McDonald's. They take orange cones and put them around them. It looked like a Holy Spirit crime scene. I don't know about you, but I kind of like that being a new normal in the earth. I kind of like it to know that people can be born again, set free, completely healed, and walk in the power of God, leading people to the... I don't know about you, but I'm in a church like that tonight. 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation. I said I'm not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation. She didn't even go through the leadership class. She didn't go through members class. She didn't go to Bible college. She just got a download of heaven. Come on, I don't know about you. God is breaking through this world. But I, can I tell you something? God's about to pour out on traditional churches. But I believe some Anglican and Episcopalian and Catholic and congregational churches and Presbyterian churches all over New England and Connecticut and, and New York are about to have encounters with the living God. <laughs> Miracles are in this room right now. Brains, blood and bones are being healed right now. Come on, I, I believe something is stirring in this room. Not something, someone. He said the waters were already stirred tonight. Can I tell you something? There, there's power in this room. There's power. You know what the power of God is? It's the life of God. And I heard the Lord say that you're stepping in to the year of virtue. The virtuous life of Jesus is about to pour out on you like never before. I was just in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Because I know you don't just want to hear about miracles in Africa and Venezuela and Australia. But just a few hours from here, got invited to teach. Been teaching there for about three years now. One, one week in the spring, I go to this Trinity Episcopal School for Ministry. It's an Episcopal Seminary, Anglican Seminary. They have this one week they call Holy Spirit Emphasis Week. At least they give them a week. <laughs> and I walked into this healing service and everybody else had the robes and the pomp and the circumstance. And I didn't know any of that. I was just in my suit. And they went through the liturgies and singing the songs at the songbooks. And I remember sitting in the back of the, I said, Lord, how are you going to move in this? They said, don't you tell me where and how I can move. I'll meet them where they are. If they're 400 years ago, I'll meet them in that move of God and I'll bring them into a present day move of God. So the dean president, Dean David Terry, he spoke and invited me to come up and minister prophetically and through healing and people were being healed and laid out. That night we came in and I spoke and I looked at this father. He was up on the platform and he was nervous the whole time I was speaking. I started praying for the sick and there was an 87 year old lady that had Alzheimer's disease she's in the second row and I began to pray for her I asked her daughter who came with her what was wrong she said miracles are already happening my mom cannot sit for more than 15 minutes without getting up and wandering away and then losing where she is and we have to constantly find her and bring her back and she said I just saw heard about this meeting in the supermarket and, and so we just came tonight and so for two hours she's just sat there and I prayed for this woman who's never had any kind of encounter, preposition, and probably never saw it on TV. We prayed for her, and the power of God hit her, and she fell out. Now, I'm not moved whether you fall out or you stand up. It doesn't really matter to me. But she fell under the power of God, and as she did, the, the father, the priest, was sitting there, and he just started going, Shandalama, Sandalama, Sandalama, and, and I could see fear and joy all mixed together. <laughs> She got up and completely healed. I, I still keep in touch with this woman who now, three, uh, two years later, completely healed of Alzheimer's disease. 87 years old. You, you know what that tells me? You're never too old for a miracle. As long as you have breath, you have purpose. As long as you have life, you have purpose. And that night, the power of God just kept falling, and this priest just kept shandala masandala. About three hours later, we walked out, and I said, Father John, are you all right? And he said, uh-huh. I want to show you something. 
he said when the, when the seminary first started, this chapel was the, the classroom, and it was the divider in classroom one and classroom two, and I was sitting in classroom one, studying church history one night, and I was eating my dinner, and I forgot to say grace, and so I opened my mouth to say, to thank the Lord, and I started speaking in tongues, and I was so afraid, I shut it down. He said, that was 26 years ago tomorrow. And today, God gave it all back to me. I'm seeing tonight what I read in that book 26 years ago. And all I know is I'll never deny it. I'll never stop it up again. Can I tell you something? That there is something that you have been born and destined to carry. It is contagious. When you are really who you are in God. When you realize that I don't got little baby Jesus in a manger in my heart. I don't got toddler Jesus in my heart. I don't got teenage Jesus in my heart. But a full grown, resurrected, filled with power from on high. Jesus lives on the inside of me. He put his hands inside of my hands. His feet inside of my feet. He's given me the mind of Christ, the heart of God. He's anointed me to be a mouthpiece for Him. Greater works will I do. Greater works are in this room. I'm going to end with this. I have seven, but I'm only going to get to three. You're about to encounter the provision of the Lord. But let me just give you a disclaimer right now. I'm not trying to get an offering. We've already taken it tonight. But I believe right now that God's about to release supernatural provision in this house to pay for the new building and whatever else you need. Ecclesiastes 11 verse 1 says, Cast your bread on the waters and many days from now it will come back to you. Can I tell you something? There's about to be supernatural provision. You're about to encounter it. I just shared this last testimony. I know we all got testimonies. I'm telling testimonies on purpose because testimonies build faith. On that mission trip to go to Venezuela, I didn't have money to go. I was at Pastor Judy's church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, preaching at a conference. And I was fretting. I was just in this place. Of the Lord was taking me to a new level and stretching me and asking me to give more and go more. And I remember fretting and just pacing in the room, crying out to God. And the Lord asked me a question that offended me. The question was simply, David, do you trust me? I said, Lord, what do you mean do I trust you? I, I'm go, I, I go to Africa. I go to places that nobody else wants to go. I, I do all those things. He said, David, I read your bio and your latest newsletter. I'm not really impressed. You, you can't do any of it without me anyway. Do you trust me? And it broke me and I fell to the ground. And I said, Lord, I trust you. He said, if you trust me, then stop trying to make it happen. Stop trying to figure it out. And just do what I tell you to do. I went back to the meeting with a better attitude that night. And at the end of the night, a little Baptist lady, 87 years old, Gloria, came running at the end of the meeting. You remember that, Pastor Judy? And she said, Brother Dave, and I knew I was in trouble because you can't say no to Grandma. She said, we have a group of 22 Baptist intercessors. We meet on Saturday mornings. And we know you're flying out, but, but we'll meet you at 4.30 in the morning if you want to. I said, I'm not that radical. 7.30. <laughs> and I poured into them, and I was just ministering. And all of a sudden, the power of God fell. And 19 of them were baptized in the Holy Spirit just all at once. And the other three were relieved because they were Baptocostal. They were closet charismatics. And, and, and they all just started praying in tongues, and it was a powerful thing. And I remember walking out that day and Sister Gloria came running from behind. I said, Brother Dave, we can't let you go until we bless you. And she handed me a check for $5,000. It's what I needed for ministry, for our, for our whole budget for a month. And, and, and I got on the plane really, really happy saying, this trust thing's working out, God. I flew home and it was the night before Mother's Day and I took my wife and family out to, for seafood. And, Benjamin, who I told you about already, he's a man of God. He likes to eat raw oysters with me. He puts the horseradish and the Tabasco and squirt a lemon on there and just slides them back. And he put an oyster in his mouth and he made a funny face and he, he spit out a pearl that size. He made the face again and spit out another pearl the same size. Two pearls in the same oyster. Watch that step, by the way. Two pearls in the same oyster. Now my wife is a skeptic, so immediately she got on the iPhone and started Googling. She found out that only one in 200,000 oysters has a pearl in it. 
and it'd be like one in a million for it to have two in it. The manager came over, and next thing I knew, Channel 3 News was there. And they said, what happened? And my son said, well, Jesus just gave my mom pearls for Mother's Day. And he starts prophesying on the news. He said, my daddy does missions work, and he's a minister. And he's been through a lot. He, he died three times of malaria, and God raised him back up. And I believe that these two pearls mean that my daddy's getting double for his trouble. It means that he'll never have to say no to going to any nation because he doesn't have the money to go. And, and he just starts, he just says it. And they broadcasted it on Sunday and Monday, and they just kept it going. Pensacola, not much else is going on. <laughs> but it's good news. How many know that good news really is good news? I went to church the next day. I was really excited. I didn't have to minister. It was a great morning. I was getting ready to leave. And this couple, Gary and Mary Lynn Benitez, came running up to me. And tears were streaming down Mary Lynn's face. She said, last night, me and Gary, we were fretting because we're three months behind on our mortgage. We're facing foreclosure. And we, we just were having intense fellowship. They're too spiritual to fight. They were having intense fellowship. And, and they were in different rooms of the house. And they were praying. And they said, while they were praying, an audible voice came and said, do you trust me? To each of them. They began to weep. And they said, the Lord told us to give you this. And now I'm crying. And I just take it and I put it in my pocket. She said, no, look at it. It's significant. And it was 900 and $86.63. The exact amount I needed to go to Venezuela the next day. We began to weep. I went to Venezuela that night that I shared about you. I shared with you about the girl on the other side of the wall. I was in my room and I was checking my emails and an email came. Gary and Mary Lynn sent me this email. It simply said, you'll never believe this. But we received a letter from a lawyer in California. And it had a check inside the letter. It seems that Gary had a grandfather he never knew he had that passed away and left everything to us 10 years ago. But we moved from California to Pensacola. And they tracked us down. It paid off their house. It, it provided a way for their kids to go to Christian school and universities. Now can I tell you something? If God did it for David Wagner, if God did it for Father's Heart Ministries, if God did it for Gary and Mary Lynn Benitez, if God did it, can I tell you something? He's no respecter of persons, so he's going to do it for harvest time. And I'm here to prophesy to you tonight. You're about to encounter the voice of God, the power of God, the provision of God. Come on, can I tell you that even if you don't have the faith for it tonight, I'll believe for it for you. Come on, I believe tonight that this is going to be a church that owes no thing to no man. That you will know no thing to no man. You will be the lender and never the borrower. You'll be above and not beneath. I believe that because of your obedience and the faith to step out in sacrifice, we'll call the blessings of God to overtake you. I don't believe you're about to step into an outpouring as much as I believe you're about to step into an overtaking. I believe there's going to be some nights where we're just going to be overtaken by the presence of God. That we can't move, we can't leave. We can't. You're about to encounter angels. You're about to encounter miracles. You're, can I tell you something? The cup of the Lord is so full. You can never drink His river dry. Come on right now. There's a move of God coming on you. I, I don't care what you need tonight. Everything you need God to be, He already is. As I close with this, one of my favorite names of God, and I love every name of God, but I really love El Shaddai. Because El comes from Elohim, and watch that step again. He's the creator creating. He's Shaddai, the many blessing one. When you literally translate it, this is what you get. If you need something and God doesn't have it, He'll create it just for you. And I feel that creative power of God I don't know what you need tonight, but even if he didn't have it, he'd create it just for you. 
But I believe there's storehouses in heaven filled with body parts. I, I believe that he's just waiting for somebody to believe to send angels ascending and descending to give you something brand new. I, I believe that there's provision coming from heaven. I, I believe there's a voice. I believe that this is the season of suddenlies. Come on, I believe that some of you that have been at harvest time for the last 30 years, you've been believing for a suddenly for the last 30 years. And sometimes suddenly isn't suddenly, but all of a sudden, all of a sudden. Come on, I believe right now. I hear the sound all of a sudden. And suddenly there's coming a sound of a mighty rushing wind. And suddenly somebody's going to touch the hem of his garment tonight. And suddenly they're about to be healed. And suddenly the provision of the Lord is going to come. And suddenly the building is going to be built. And suddenly there'll be another expansion. And another and another and another. As I close for the 38th time, and I promise I'm done. gave this prophetic word to Pastor Glenn and Denise today. I said, well, really what God is doing in this next season is giving your children and your children's children memories. I remember when we were building a building and God provided. I remember when there was a sick person in the church and God showed up and healed them. I remember when we didn't know what to do and suddenly God spoke. See, I believe that your children and your children's children are about to have experiences with God. They're going to have supernatural memory banks that no matter what the world has to offer them, they'll say, I can't go there because I remember. I remember. I remember what I saw at that altar. I remember what I heard that preacher preach. I remember what happened when hands got laid on me. I remember when the Holy Spirit came upon me. I remember when God showed up and provided. I I remember. It's good to celebrate. It's good to remember. So I really do close tonight. Stay filled up harvest time. Don't ever run on empty. If you're empty tonight, just get filled back up again. Tonight, right now in this place, if you need an encounter with God, He's here. But I would say don't just get an encounter. I'd say be an encounter. Be that walking Jesus. Be the voice of God in the earth. Be who people need Him to be today. But I release that anointing. Pastor Judy started. She was about to preach my message. Isaiah 61. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's anointed me to preach good news to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set the captive free, to declare the good and acceptable year of the Lord's favor. Come on, that anointing is coming on you tonight. Come on, he's good. God's in a really good mood tonight. Lord, right now, would you just pour out your spirit in this place? Just pour out your spirit in this place. That word of knowledge came forth a few minutes ago. God wants to heal brains, blood, and bones. Specifically with brains, I saw the Lord dissolving clots and issues. And I feel like maybe somebody in this room, you have have an impediment or almost like heart because of, 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 a, of a, a previous stroke or something and I saw the Lord completely healing the brain but healing the body associated with it if I'm talking to you about brain issues brain disorders I want you to get up your seat and come right now to the front of this place come on right now I believe that Jesus the healer right now Lord right now any brain disease any brain disorder right now in Jesus name come right here bones it may be arthritis it may be a broken bone that didn't heal maybe that you have a broken bone right now something with bones right now Jesus the healer is here you have some kind of blood disease blood disorder Come on, I saw the Lord coming and healing tonight. There's healing power in this room. Let's you just move right here. You have some incurable disease. Come on, right now, just if you get out of your seat, and I believe many of you, even as you're walking here right now, you're being healed on the way. Healed on the way. Healed on the way. 
feel fire in my ears. I, I feel fire in my shoulders right now. I saw the Lord replacing hips and knees and shoulders, rotator cuffs. One thing I love about Jesus is that whenever you start talking about who he is and what he does, he just shows up and does it. The Bible says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Come on, I believe that he's just testifying and he's prophesying tonight. Come on, it's a night to invade the impossible. All week as I've been preparing to come here, I've had this vision numerous times. I like these C-130 cargo jets flying over harvest time and opening up. It wasn't dropping bombs on you. It was dropping invitations. Invitations to invade the impossible. Invitations to, into the above and beyond of God. Invitations into healing. Invitations into the miraculous. Come on, right now, some of you need to even grab a hold of this word for people that aren't even here tonight, but you're believing for them. Come on, I believe tumors will melt like wax. I believe people you've been contending for. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, come on, those of you that have come, just lift up your hand, just lift your hands to the front of this place. Come on, if you believe in the, in the congregation right now that God can do miracles and you want to you wanna be that encounter of God right now, I want you to stretch forth your hand. Come on, stretch forth your faith right now up here. Come on, I believe there's a movement coming through this body. There's a movement coming through this region like never before. Holy Spirit, do it again. Holy Spirit, do it again. Come like you promised. Lord, right now, Lord, I thank you that in this place, Lord, miracles, signs and wonders, Lord, are just normal. Lord, it's just normal Christianity. Lord, you said we could lay hands on the sick and they'd recover. Lord, you said that in your name we'd cast out devils. In your name we'd speak in other tongues. Lord, we want it all. We want it all. Come on, tonight will you just tell Jesus, Jesus, I want it all. Jesus, I want everything you have for me. I take every limit off. Lord, I take off every limitation. I heard the Lord say over your lives tonight, no more delay and no more disappointment. No more delay and no more disappointment. No more delay and no more disappointment. Father, let hope rise in this room. Lord, let faith rise in this room. Lord, I thank you right now that, Lord, you're great, God. Lord, I thank you that, Lord, not only is this a place that's received the harvest, Lord, it is a place of transformation like Pastor Nick talked about tonight. Lord, you're transforming us more and more into your image and into your glory. Lord, right now, in Jesus' name, Lord, I declare that Parkinson's...